Thinking back to the dawning of the 1990s can trigger a plethora of nostalgic emotions for a pop culture junkie like myself. But few of those memories can hit as close to the heart as time spent playing the NES and experiencing Disney TV shows, movies, and theme parks with family and friends. So when Capcom and Disney joined forces to produce a collection of NES games, it was bound to be a successful partnership. Retro gamers frequently recall their fond memories with games like DuckTales, Chippendale Rescue Rangers, and Darkwing Duck. But one lesser discussed Capcom and Disney title is Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, where you can virtually explore a Disney theme park and become immersed in classic rides like Space Mountain, Pirates of the Caribbean, and even the Haunted Mansion. And thanks to detailed accounts from producers at the core of this game's development, and me actually playing through two different early prototypes of Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, we will discuss many special additions, omissions, and nuances that shape the final product, and can help you complete the game yourself. And I can't wait to share all the secrets and history with you in today's video. So let's get started. And if this is your first time here at the channel, my name is Tyler, and if you love gaming from all generations like we do here at G3, then consider hitting that subscribe button and hit that bell for notifications so you don't miss anything. By the end of the 1980s, the Walt Disney Company and its CEO Michael Eisner had managed to recapture the Disney magic in the hearts of millions, with films like Who Framed Roger Rabbit and The Little Mermaid after struggling in previous decades following the death of Walt Disney. These movies, along with a host of other successes, allowed Eisner to further expand Disney's reach into multiple new media ventures, such as the creation of its own video game division when Walt Disney Computer Software was founded in 1988. While initially focused on personal computer titles, Disney soon collaborated with Capcom for its first North American release for the NES, when Capcom ported Mickey Mouse Capade from Hudson Soft's Disney Famicom game titled Mickey Mouse Adventures in Wonderland. Capcom's ability to craft Mickey Mouse Capade for North American consumers earned Disney's trust to develop a host of future NES games, beginning with DuckTales. Capcom would eventually send their entire Japanese development team to California to visit Disneyland and fully immerse themselves in Disney culture for inspiration, and to establish lines of trust and communication with the producers at Walt Disney Computer Software, such as Darlene Lacey. Disney's marketing department would negotiate licensing deals with Capcom, who would then develop the games in Japan and send their rough prototypes to Disney's producers for final revisions and approval. Lacey's role as a producer focused primarily on ensuring that each video game stayed true to Disney's licensed properties and represented the quality and attention to detail that the company strives for. Lacey, who was credited as Darlene Waddington in her NES contributions, had already co-produced DuckTales and was the head producer for two Capcom titles that released in June of 1990, and those are Chippendale Rescue Rangers and Adventures in the Magic Kingdom. After implementing more traditional platformer styles with DuckTales and Chippendale Rescue Rangers, both Disney and Capcom were ready to try something different by creating a more difficult game that would appeal to older gamers yet not completely exclude a younger audience. So centering a game around Disney theme parks was a reasonable idea, because let's not forget that Walt Disney created Disneyland to captivate both children and adults alike. Adventures in the Magic Kingdom's basic premise is that Goofy accidentally left the golden key for the gate to the enchanted castle inside its walls. Now he, Mickey, and Donald need you and your gigantic cowboy hat to collect six silver keys scattered throughout the Magic Kingdom to finally unlock the castle's gate, so the Disney parade can begin. The project got off on the wrong foot, because the initial EEPROM that Capcom presented to Disney was further along in development than earlier titles. Lacey was not happy with the overall design, stating almost nothing in the game made me think of Disney. This was mainly because Capcom was focused more on creating a larger and more challenging game than its other Disney NES titles. 
and even more challenging was the language and physical communication barriers between US-based Disney and Capcom's Japanese staff. So it's probably safe to say this wasn't the happiest working environment on Earth. But Lacey and the team at Capcom would ultimately compromise and blend the select screen concept used in games like Mega Man and free exploration in an overworld map environment that would mimic the general layout of a Disney park to access levels at your own discretion. The five levels included are Space Mountain, Autopia, Big Thunder Mountain, Pirates of the Caribbean, and of course the Haunted Mansion, which is unbelievably called the Haunted House in the manual. Lacey said naming it just the Haunted House was intentional, as to not label it specifically to one Disney theme park. Her statement seems rather strange and hypocritical to me given how much of a stickler she was regarding other minor details, like her having Capcom change the originally designed drawbridges in the Autopia level to extending bridges because drawbridges fit more a medieval theme, which does not belong in a futuristic race car attraction. But apparently Disney's intention was to have a certain degree of ambiguity to the park featured in Adventures in the Magic Kingdom. Take the castle for example. The game box and cartridge artwork clearly features Cinderella's castle from Walt Disney World in Florida, but the overall in-game design of the castle favors Sleeping Beauty's castle at Disneyland in California, with the in-game castle also having its own unique name, the Enchanted Castle. To help you get a more proper and hopefully nostalgic experience of Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, I'm going to provide a brief description of each level, followed by actual gameplay footage and music while highlighting strategic elements, trivia, prototype differences, and even interesting development stories for each attraction. So let's begin with Space Mountain. I feel Capcom did great with their visuals in the Space Mountain level given the real-life attraction takes place in darkness. But the so-called navigating of the ship to Star F is basically a series of quick time events guiding you to a silver key rather easily. So just enjoy the sights and sounds while playing this one. Autopia is definitely the easiest of the levels in my opinion, and has some serious bump and jump vibes. What makes this so-called race so easy is that it isn't really a race, because all you need to do is make it to the finish line to defeat the level. Big Thunder Mountain is an action-packed and fast-paced train ride that gives me the most anxiety while playing. Dodging the boulders and crossing guards are already difficult enough, but adding in abrupt dead ends and hairpin turns just seem unfair, unless you plan to memorize the entire track yourself. And you better hope that your final destination is the first or fourth station because good luck finding the right track to guide you to those middle platforms. This level is just madness.
Pirates of the Caribbean is where the game starts to feel like your typical Capcom Disney platformer. You must rescue six villagers that pirates have taken hostage and light a signal fire before completing the level. Oh yeah, and the candle to light that fire is the only weapon you can use, and it's located underground near the end of the level. So you're basically just running around and playing tag with a bunch of pirates and tied up villagers for most of the game. The Haunted House is by far the most challenging and well-constructed level in Adventures in the Magic Kingdom. You have plenty of opportunities to rid this dwelling of its 999 inhabitants by collecting candles that you can hurl at these ghosts to defeat them. It also has all the frustrating but ultimately rewarding elements for a successful platformer, like awkward jumps, a kickback effect, and moving platforms but make sure you don't waste all of those candles before facing off with the game's only boss, the Master Spectre. And if these levels are giving you more trouble than expected, make sure to take advantage of collecting stars during your attempts to earn special features on the select screen, like extra hearts, invincibility, enemy freezes, and even extra lives. Lacey admits there was originally a sixth level program for Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, and it was based on the Jungle Cruise attraction, with the entrance likely being located here in the bottom left corner of the map. Now that covers five of the six keys needed to complete Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, but how do we collect that final one? The sixth key is obtained after correctly answering a series of Disney trivia questions from guests scattered throughout the park. This was an element that Lacey added specifically to further Disneyfy the experience, and she admits to making the questions a little bizarre and difficult stating I wanted the little kids to have to either guess and learn or ask their parents. That's just the sadist in me. Thanks to the Cutting Room Floors website, we have quite a list of Easter eggs and secret messages hidden in the text-based trivia game from the programmer himself. The lead programmer and designer for Adventures in the Magic Kingdom that had to refine and implement all of Disney's requests was Capcom's Yoshinori Takanaka. These messages can be revealed by entering a combination of Game Genie codes and button commands listed here, with the most memorable of these messages stating that Saturday's morning is morning salad, which was a nod to the long hours Takenaka put in while programming this game and not being able to keep his meal times on a regular schedule. Adventures in the Magic Kingdom was definitely overshadowed by the simultaneous release of Chippendale Rescue Rangers in the summer of 1990 with the latter gracing the cover of issue 14 of Nintendo Power, and having a seven-page spread highlighting its gameplay. Adventures in the Magic Kingdom faded into obscurity on page 82, in a one-page article in the video short section, that displayed only a lukewarm review. I mean, there is even a promo for Rescue Rangers in its own game manual. 
Look, I'm not arguing that Adventures in the Magic Kingdom should have been flying off store shelves during its release. And I would classify it as one of those solid NES rental games that you could take home for a weekend for a few bucks when you needed a Disney fix. And luckily it's not more than a few bucks to purchase this game today if you want to add it to your own collection. For that magical combination of Disney and NES nostalgia. Special shout out to Mark for finding Mullet Boy first in our Golf NES Secrets and History video. And as always a special thank you to each of our Patreon supporters. Till next time guys, G3 out.